Hey there, this is MathCamp321, and on this video I'm going to show you how to take the derivative of an exponential function, particularly when the base is e. So if you get your packet out and turn to the page that has number 3 on it, we're going to do a derivation of the derivative itself, and it's set up like a two-column proof from geometry, which is good, because the reasons are going to guide us through each step. So we're starting with y equals e to the x. And the question is, how do we take the derivative of something like this? Well, our next step in the proof would be to take the natural log of both sides. In step three, we're told to take the power rule on the right-hand side, or the power ranger rule, if you prefer. And that's going to allow that x, which serves as the exponent for e, to jump down in front of the ln. Now in step four, we're told to use the substitution property. And I'm gonna substitute in for the natural log of e. What is the natural log of e? Well, as many of you probably know, the natural log of e is one. So the right-hand side becomes x times one, or just x. In step five, it says to differentiate with respect to x. So on the left-hand side, I'm gonna take the derivative of the natural log of y. This places the argument in the denominator and its derivative in the numerator. Well, the derivative of y with respect to x would be dy dx or y prime. The derivative of x is simply one. Now I'm going to isolate y prime by cross multiplying. y prime will equal y. And in our final step, we're told to use substitution again. Well, if you look at step one, it tells you what y is y is e to the x. So y prime ends up equaling y, which is in fact e to the x. And you see this little emoticon at the bottom, and he says the derivative is itself. The derivative ends up being exactly what we started with. Now this is going to get a little bit more complicated if our exponent is not just x. If it's something more complicated than x, then we're going to have to multiply by the derivative of that and we'll look at the specific rule on the next slide. Okay, so now we're on slide number two, where I will formally present the rules for taking the derivative of an exponential function with base e, and then we'll look at a couple of examples. So if we look in the box, it says taking the derivative of an exponential function of base e raised to the x just ends up being e to the x, and we saw that on the proof in slide one. But what if the exponent is something more complicated than x? We can generalize this exponent by calling it u. If you take the derivative of e to the u, you end up repeating e to the u, but then you also have to multiply by the derivative of whatever that exponent happened to be. Let's take a look at a specific example. In 4a, we're asked to take the derivative of e to the 2x minus 1. So I'm going to allow u to equal 2x minus 1. And the derivative of u, which I'll call u prime, is equal to 2. So therefore, the derivative of this is going to equal e to the 2x minus 1, it's just a repeat of what I started with, times the derivative of that exponent, which in this case happened to be 2. And maybe I'll just do one more rewrite, putting the 2 in front. Let's try another example. In 4b, we're asked to find the derivative of e to the negative 3x. So our exponent is something a little bit more complicated than just an x. So let's go ahead and allow u to equal that exponent. Now I'm ultimately going to have to take the derivative of this, so I'm going to make it more calculus friendly by rewriting it as negative 3x to the negative 1. Now when I go to take the derivative of this, I'm going to notate it in the following way u prime equals 3x to the negative 2. Now you're not supposed to leave any answers with negative exponents, so I'm going to do one more rewrite as 3 over x squared. So in the end, our derivative is going to be a rewrite of what I started with, so e to the negative 3 over x, times the derivative of that exponent, which is 3 over x squared. And I'll do one last rewrite expressing this as a single simplified fraction. Now I'm not sure if any of you picked up on it, but I just contradicted myself. I said throughout doing the, the substitution step, the u substitution, that we're not supposed to leave our answer with negative exponents. 
And if you look at the answer that I've placed in the box, we have a negative exponent. It's actually okay in this case because that's how the problem started. The problem was initially expressed to us with a negative exponent. So having it in this component of our answer is okay in this case. And I know that can be confusing, but if the problem starts off with it in that form, then it's okay to end in that form. Let's go on to the third slide. So now we're on slide number three, looking at number five, where we're asked to find the relative extrema for the function f of x equals x times e to the x. And I've provided the graph for you here. Now, when you're asked to find the relative extrema and you're looking at a graph, you're really looking for relative minimums and relative maximums, or, or relative maximums. Now in this case, there's obviously a relative minimum and not a relative maximum, but let's actually do the calculus to convince ourselves that we're doing it correctly. So the first step in finding relative extrema would be to find the derivative. And since we have a product here, we might consider using the product rule. So I'm going to go ahead and set up my f, f prime, g, g prime chart. My first function is x, and its derivative is going to be 1. Our second function is e to the x, and its derivative is going to be e to the x. Now using the product rule, and notating everything properly, f prime of x will be the first function, x, times the derivative of the second function, plus the second function, times the derivative of the first function. Now I can clean this up, and I can also factor out an e to the x, which is present in both terms. Now that we've found the first derivative and we've cleaned it up, I want to find the critical numbers by setting the derivative equal to zero. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'm now going to set each independent factor equal to zero. And I'm going to do the blue factor first because it's easy. And now I'll have a little discussion about setting e to the x equal to zero. And what I'm going to ask you to do is think about this graphically. Where does e to the x intersect with y equals zero? So you have to remember back to pre-calculus what the graph of e to the x looks like. This is an exponential function. This is a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. And it ends up looking like this. If I ask where does this graph intersect the x-axis, it doesn't at all. So this is not going to produce any critical numbers. So the only critical number that we have is x equals negative one. Now let's assume that we didn't have the graph in front of our faces. How would we know if that negative 1 is a relative max or a relative min? Well, you'd have to use either the first or the second derivative test. So that's what I'm going to do now is the first derivative test. So I'm going to use a number line and do some test values. And again, I choose to notate everything so it's very clear to the grader on an AP what exactly I'm doing. So the value that I'm looking at is negative 1. And over here I'm going to test something that's easy to work with, so maybe 0. And over here I want to test something that's easy to work with, maybe negative 2. Let's do the 0 first. Remember, I'm plugging this into the derivative, which is up here. So e to the 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. And that value is positive, which means that the graph is increasing. And if we cheat by looking up here, we can see that it is increasing. Now if I put negative 2 in, e to the negative 2, I could actually look at the graph over here. If I plug in negative 2, the output is going to be some sort of positive number, so that's going to be positive. But negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, and the product of a positive and a negative is a negative, which means that the original function is decreasing. And again, we could just cheat by looking up here. So the graph is decreasing until it gets to negative 1, and then it is increasing, which means we have a relative minimum. So I'm going to go ahead and write that we have a relative minimum. And that occurs when x is negative 1. Now to figure out the corresponding y value, I'm going to plug it into the original function. So the original function, of course, is here. So we've got x, which is negative 1, or just negative, and then e to the x, or e to the negative 1. So the relative minimum is there, but if you're uncomfortable with this negative exponent, you might choose to write it as negative 1, comma, the opposite of 1 over e.